We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop patron Jeff Zeus, who writes, It's common advice that you should learn a game before you get it to the table and bore two or three other people trying to learn it. But some folks may find it hard to sit with a game alone and really figure it out. Also, sometimes you're at a public play event and want to try something nobody at your table owns. Have you any tips for a group trying to unbox and learn a game together for the first time? Well, thanks, Jeff, for the great question and, of course, for your support as one of our patrons. Now, I want to start off with the first thing Jeff said there, I because this is something I feel pretty strongly about, something we have talked about going, like, episodes back. We've been talking about this forever. You really should not only try to learn a game before showing up to play it, but also do all the prep work that's required, like punching things out, sorting the components into baggies, all of that before it hits the table for play. Like this is something I think came up in our second podcast ever, and we've repeated many times on the show. Doing that extra prep is worth it. There are multiple reasons for this, but first of all, it just makes you look better in so many ways. Organized, knowledgeable, and prepared people have a better experience and are going to have a better experience and will always be looking forward to having other people play with you when you're more prepared. Mm. That being said, there are always going to be edge cases yeah. and friends uh, are the ones who are going to be accepting, supportive and encouraging when things don't go just right. Now, the second part of Jeff's question, though, does lead me to clarify what we've said in the past about this in a way I don't think has actually come up, which leads me to my first true tip. You the game owner, the person with the game, the person who bought it, who it shows up at your house. You don't have to be the one to do all the work. Now, maybe this goes back to the thing Roger mentioned last week in our feedback um, about the endowment effect where you want to hold on to things that are in your hand and you put undue value in being a game owner. Like it's a, it's a psychological thing that you might want to try to overcome because a game is something that a group of people are going to enjoy together. And to that end, those people should work together to enjoy the game. So there shouldn't be any pressure or requirement for the game owner to do all that work, to open it, unpackage it, rebox it, learn it, understand it, download rule updates, check the FAQ, get player aids, laminate player sheets. Well, it's going to be physically easier for the owner to do this, at least when they first get the game, because of the ones would start with it in their hand. There is no reason you can't pass that game off to someone in your group who's more interested in doing that additional work if you're not interested in it yourself. Now, of course, some of you might have very mm. strong feelings about who can and can't unbox a game that you paid for. And some people may not even have a regular game group. Mm -hmm. They may play solo much of the time and bring games out to the FLGS to find players. But for the rest of you... So here's a thought right? Have your regular game night, play your games, play whatever you want to play, play whatever you picked up two weeks ago, something you prepped and everyone knows ahead of time. And then before everyone goes home, put all of the new hotness on the table, yours, whatever Sean's picked up, Deanna's latest games, throw them on the table and divvy it up, share the responsibility evenly between the players or work with the players who you know, enjoy learning and teaching and punching games if that's your group like if there's two people do it split it between them if three people do it split between them if no one really likes doing it share the wealth share the pain work on it all together maybe even take things a step further and open stuff up at the end of your game night like have an unboxing period at the end of your regular game night and open them up punch them but leave the learning for later that way, the game learner or whoever's going to learn and teach the game can just take the rule books. That way, you're not hauling games back and forth or worrying about someone else taking your game that you just bought. And that way, everyone can unpunch their own games, too. Now, again, you could share the work of getting games ready to play, too. If you've got multiple games you're going to open up, one person cuts the strength, the next starts punching stuff, a third's putting stuff into baggies, and fourth player's gathering up the rule materials. Like, these aren't hard and fast rules. Obviously, you're going to change it depending on how many people you have in your group or what resources and what stuff comes in the games. One of the big changes in learning, the learning aspect, is YouTube, of course. Rule mm -hmm. books are something that more and more are reference material to check during the game and not how we learn games. 
Yes. It's certainly easy enough to pick your preferred online game teacher or even one recommended by the publisher nowadays and throw mm -hmm. it up on the TV or tablet for everyone to watch together. So there are those are a few tips for making sure the game gets learned and prepped before game night. But Jeff's real question is, what if that's not possible? For whatever reason, uh, there's no time. Your group just doesn't want to wait. You're at the game store and they got something new in. So you buy it and you just want to bring it to a table, play right away. Um, you fully plan to rule, learn the rules and sit down and play a solo play. But then something came up. You got a call from where your dad lives. It, it's going to happen. Even I sit down at the table with new shrink wrap games now and then and try to learn it along with everyone else. It happens to the best of us. And of course, the game matters too. Cracking the shrink on Ticket to Ride New York is a matter mm -hmm. of minutes, while cracking the shrink on Orleans is going to take you a little while. Yeah, definitely true. So my first tip when you're sitting down and everyone's like, oh, we have a new game in front of us. What do we do? Is basically a repeat of the last one. Start off by sharing the work, right? Crack open the shrink, open her up and dive in. Split the components up between the players. Have people punching, other people sorting. Have someone flip to the game setup section of the rule book, which is honestly usually the first page in. If you're really lucky, there's a separate sheet. And then you get things going, right? Like, work out the components, work it together, and try to get the game running as quickly as possible. This is actually one thing I wish publishers often did differently. Mm -hmm. Well, after a while, most people can set up the games they play regularly from memory. Even then, there are often details we forget. Yeah. How many of this thing do you start off in a three-player game? How often have you heard something or similar to that being mm -hmm. said? We've all said it. I would just love to see either a one sheet or a separate page in the manual in every game that was just yeah. the setup. Nothing else, easy to find, step, 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 step. Don't hide it with the piece count or among the background information. Just give me the table setup details, clean and clear. Yeah, and it is not common. I have definitely seen it. Uh, thank you, Vital Resorta, and um, I think his... Uh, Forgetting the name, Ian O'Toole as as the graphic designer. I think the two, the, they're a pair that tend to do a good job of it. Stonemire actually is usually rather good about it. Um, having reference material that works is a huge part of making a game easier to learn. Now, an alternative for this is if you're at a public play event or you have a big game group, right? Like you're getting together with eight, twelve people, not just like you and your three friends. Would be to sorry i'm mixing this up with the next one i this is what i get for not quite <laughs> following the script so I, i'm i i'm i'm jumping just a bit so alternative for this is if you're at a public play event and there is a person who's interested in learning the game right like i bought it but sean's like oh i don't mind sitting through that and reading it have them do that off to the side while everyone else is still playing something now, this is what I do the most often at a public play event when I've got a new game I really want to share and I haven't had time, but I'm usually playing host anyway, right? I'm, I'm there as the, the Windsor Gaming Ambassador sharing the Windsor Gaming Resorts event, and I'm already watching for people coming in the doors and doing other things. I know I'm not going to play games the entire time I'm there. So I'm perfectly cool with spending, you know, 10, 20 minutes in a corner, punching something out and getting it set up on the table before calling people over. Now, this has the bonus of letting the game owner be the one punching it out which, like I said, is an issue. Some people take that very seriously, and I understand it. You're not having to worry about someone else ripping, tearing something, losing a piece, and plus, there's a whole thing about organizing the game how you want. The bad part is they're the only ones that are getting to touch and see the bits. That's actually why I prefer the shared experience is everyone's kind of seeing everything at the same time and touching it and getting the tact on, okay, those are the cubes. What are those cubes for? Okay, the cubes are for this. Um, you can also do this at a home game night, I guess, though to me, having someone sit in the corner doing their own thing would feel odd at one of my events but that could be perfectly normal for your group where someone sits off and plays switch for a while between rounds i don't know every game group's different nobody puts baby in the corner unless they're ne learning the new game for later and then it's okay <laughs> now next up as for learning the game you got it punched you got it kind of organized you've got it set up to the best of your ability again all you've done is kind of look at the setup diagram put things places that kind of make sense there's a few ways you can go and I'm going to start off with the old school approaches, the stuff we've been using for years. 
Now this gets to what I got confused on here, where if you're at a public group or you happen to be playing in a large group, right? You got 12 person game night, you got three different tables going. The first thing, and, and I find people are, are reluctant to do this, is to see if anyone else at the event knows the game and can teach it. Now, if you are playing at a local game store or a gaming cafe or something like that, this includes the staff at the venue. One of the biggest assets of playing in public play events or with large groups is that you get a pool of gamer knowledge and experience in one place. Use that. Like I've sat and seen people trying to frustratedly figure out a game, like just stand up and say, hey, anyone know this game that they can teach me? Now, jumping back to something we talked about, I don't even know how many episodes ago now, well, about putting signs on tables for organizing public play events is having a sign system could really help with this, where you put a sign out that says, we're looking for someone to teach the game. But it doesn't hurt to ask. Like if you're at a local game store, go ask the staff, right? Like most local game stores have people on hand that can teach at least the demo copies of the games they have in the store, but often are more knowledgeable. And in a, a proper gaming cafe, like if you're going to Snakes and Lattes, they pay people to teach games that are there just for that reason. Though if you have just picked the new hotness hot off the shelf, yeah, you may not be able to find anyone. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Plus, the other thing too is you don't want to impose. I get it. That's the thing. But ask, and people can say no. And the other thing is, if you are someone who can teach games, realize you can say no, and realize, let me finish this game. I'll head over when I'm done. Is a valid response. Now, if you don't get lucky, you didn't find an available game teacher, you just bought the new hotness, so no one knows how to play it yet. Um, what I would do is sit at the table with the other players and say, is anyone a rule learner? Is anyone really good at absorbing rules and figuring games? So who's played the most games, right? They then do it on their own, right? They sit down, learn the game. Um, in general, I recommend this person do this as a solo experience um, and try to avoid reading the rules out to other players. While they're doing that, you can do some of the setup stuff, right? Like possibly punching things or getting cards ready and so on. If you can, only finish part of the rules. Like try not to devour the whole thing because you might be able to just read enough to get the game going. Like read setup, sit and do setup all together. Then read through like turn one. And then read through the next section. Like because not every game needs you to read the entire rules in order to get playing. Fancy Flight's famous for this. They have these little quick start guides and they have reference guides. Try to get to the playing and using the references quickly. I also, again, recommend not reading. So have the player who's good at teaching read the rules and then summarize it to the other players. That way they can skip over the fiddly bits that aren't important. Like, why does this have to happen? No, just take three of these and put them here. Don't worry about why. We'll just get going. Now, the only time I would actually have someone read the rules is if everyone else at the table agrees to it. That'll never happen with Deanna at the table. You're just going to put her to sleep with me. I'd be like, all right, go for it. I hate it. Like I prefer actually generally I'd say, just give me the rules. I'm going to go to the washroom and I'll be back in 10 minutes. I'll have devoured most of it. So I'll be able to explain when I get back. Right. Cause you don't think about like, like reading a 34 pages, like ridiculously long instructions nowadays, unless you're sitting down to play a GMT war game, these rule books don't take that long to read. So I honestly think it's better to do it on your side. But if you do have a bunch of people who are perfectly cool at just sitting attentively and listening to you and soaking up rules, it's a rare skill, but go for it. Well, I'm actually not bad at this, but often the game can impact how well this uh, works. Some mm -hmm. games have so much required front-loaded knowledge yeah. that there's only so much summary you can do and you're almost required to end up reading it out uh, anyway. Yeah, there's, it, it is so rough, right? Like, I'm just thinking back to when I was trying to teach tapestry, and I'm like, honestly, the first game, just do stuff, and I'll tell you what it does. Like, don't plan ahead. Don't try to figure out the icon. Just go, I'm going to go up the technology track, and I'll tell you what that icon means. Getting people to do that is sometimes harder. Now, if you don't have someone that's good at quickly absorbing rules and then teaching them to other people, then I suggest doing the break it up, right? That ha Pick someone to read through one section at a time. Try to learn while playing check to the setups right hand out all the player components read the actions you can take on a turn and and just like like play with it go here well what if you took a move action what would you do okay if you took this action what would you do try to get the game actually going and get people touching pieces interacting and moving things instead of just sitting there and this also stands for if you do have one person who learned the game get people playing and engaged you want people focused on the rules and not bored sitting waiting to learn like just get people doing stuff Again, though, this is one of those things that's going to be game dependent. Some games just don't always work that way. Yeah, that's true. Now, playing the game does lead me to a side note. This first game, you've just cracked the shrink. No one knows what they're doing is a learning game. No one's played before. The points don't matter. 
Who cares who wins? At this point, the goal of playing this game isn't to dominate the other players or to be the winner. Your goal of this game is to learn to play the game, to figure it out. This should be true for your first play of any game, to be honest, even if someone has learned the rules ahead of time, but even more so when everyone at the table is trying to learn the game at the same time. It's your first game. You are going to play extreme, but if you are careful and learn what has gone wrong, you'll be better for it. You'll all be better yeah, for it the next time around. So now we get to like, that's the old school approach, right? Right now we have the internet technology. It's ubiquitous. The thing is people forget it's there. I don't know how many times I've been at the local game store and gamers are sitting there taking pictures of the games they're playing, looking up FAQs and logging their plays on board game geek and texting their wives. But no one thinks to bring up a how to play video to watch when they don't know how to play a game. Like for most modern gaming groups, there's probably someone has a phone or a tablet on hand. And I do realize there are people that are underprivileged who do not have access to this. In that case though, maybe you can ask the store. Store owner might have something, or maybe they have a computer there they can bring up. Set that in the middle of the table, load up, watch it played, Rado, gaming rules, whoever your favorite rule instruction videos are. Or alternatively, again, do the one person thing. Have one person watch an appropriate video and have them teach everyone else. Even better, if you know you're going to play ahead of time, remember this whole being prepared thing we talked about at the beginning, email or text everyone who's going to play a link to the video so everyone already knows as at least watched it once when they showed up. That's not the same of having to sit down, open, learn to play a game, set all the components and have it ready to go. That's a lot less work and something you can probably get buy-in for even for the laziest of players. And this goes for even if you just think you're going to buy it. Hey, you know what? On Saturday when we're at the FLGS, I'm, I'm, I've got the money. I think I'm going to pick up Tapestry. Mm-hmm. How about everybody watch this video before? That way we can start playing it exactly. when I get it on Saturday. Now, yep. There are two trains of thoughts for this. One, make sure everyone watches the same video mm. so that they're on the same page. Or let people watch different videos. Watch their own personal favorite mm-hmm. creator. As some videos do have mistakes or slightly different ways to do things. The yep. combined knowledge could work out to a better first game. But yeah, that's going to vary within uh, how you how you decide to, to work within your group. So I am, I am a learn from the book player always have been i am read the rules cover to cover sit down and what i do is i use watch it played videos sorry that i'm branding that i didn't mean to brand that I, I how to play videos after the fact to see what i did wrong that's what i prefer them for to me they're the reminder or the whole i haven't played the game in a month it's a quick reminder it's put on a video i put it on two times speed i watch through it quick and go yeah yeah okay i remember all this but i have been to game nights where players are arguing like but rodney said this but but uh paul said this but but Marty said this and, and it ends up that you look at the rule and all three were wrong. So it is definitely a thing. But in that case, you do still have the rules there, right? You're still sitting at the store. You can look stuff up. Yep. Now to help with all this game learning, this is again, yes, it's a bit of prep ahead of time. But if you can, again, it doesn't take the full time of having to punch and organize and learn a game is have someone in the group take a moment to jump on board game geek, check the file section for the game. Fans are awesome at creating rule summaries, one-page rule books, player aids, and things like that that can make it easier for the group to learn a new game. You may even want to put these up on your phone and even just like flip through them and use that at the table if no one did have the time to say print something ahead of time. Just don't read the game reviews. You're just getting the box open. Don't let board game reviewers spoil your first play. Yeah. No, I agree. I try to I try to avoid most reviews before playing games. And I, to be honest, I ignore most other reviewers for anything I'm all that curious about until I play it, because I disagree with a lot of people. Tapestry is a Civ game. Uh, next, I have got the tip no one actually follows. And every time we bring it up, there's usually someone in the chat room who's like, brilliant, yes, we should do that more often. Don't finish the game. Get playing as quick as possible, as noted earlier. Play to find out what happens. Play to learn, not to win. It shouldn't take an entire game to figure out how to play. And once everyone's comfortable, once everyone's got it, everyone knows what's going on, stop. Maybe give the rule book a once over to make sure you weren't playing extreme, because trust me, you probably were. And then restart a new round. Now everyone knows what's going on. This should be a much more enjoyable gaming experience now with everyone getting it, crocking it, and ready to play. Don't fall for getting back to Roger's uh, 
psycho i forget the, the he had a funky term for it psychological mechanics psycho mechanics psycho player mechanics whatever you call them but don't fall for the sunk cost fallacy that you wasted your time unless you finish a game this is something i find kids are often better at it's when mm. we grow older that it becomes more of a problem especially if you're the one winning the game when yeah. it's time to wrap it up we all want to win after all because well it feels good that's part of yeah. part of playing games but that's why you have to stress that. That's why I mentioned earlier, you have to stress, look, it's a learning game. We don't care who wins. We're not playing to win. We're trying to make sure everyone understands that and it's on the same page. If you're that competitive, don't sit at a table about to break a game open for the first time. Go play something you already can dominate at and kick butt and then come back once these players have learned the game and they can teach you. Finally, I do have a bonus tip. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to have some patience. I know you're all excited about that new game. You're in full-on hype mode. You're at full froth, as the secret cabal would say. And you just need to get that game to the table right now. Maybe take a step back and think for a moment. This is a new game. This is something you're excited about. This is something you want to share with your friends. You want to share it with other people. And you want that experience of playing it for the first time to be as fun as possible. You want that hot new game to live up to the hype. Maybe, maybe, just maybe hold off a week. You put the game aside. You all play something you know. Well, playing, sure, talk about it. Oh, I can't wait to try this. Have you heard this about, oh, did you see the components? Did you see the back of the box? Sure, talk about it. But save actually breaking it open and playing it for the next game night. And then make sure the prep is done for that next event. So again, remember, it doesn't have to be the person who bought the game that does all the work for next week. Well, I understand where the I bought it so I should thoughts come from. But are you the only one who's going to play it, enjoy it as well? Have you never played and enjoyed someone else's games? If you're buying it as a collector's piece, you shouldn't be punching it anyways. If yeah. you're buying it to play, then sharing the fun, and part of that fun is doing all the prep work. And I have to give full credit to um, local gamer Jamie and his friend Clayton. Clayton buys the games and actually gets them shipped to Jamie's house. Then Jamie opens them, plays them, learns how to play, and then Clayton goes to Jamie's to play Clayton's games that he bought. And it works better. for That's what works for them. Clayton's the one with the money. Clayton's the one with the, the um, acquisition disorder that needs a massive collection. And Jamie keeps so many games at his house and Clayton takes other ones home. I, I, I like, first time I heard that, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, well, wait, wait, that doesn't make, why would you do, but, but like, why would he give you his game? And he's like, he just wants to play it. That's why he bought the game. He doesn't care if his shelf looks pretty. I do. So I get to put it on my shelf. Now, before we move on, I do want to just summarize, because that was a, a, bunch of info dump kind of there all at once so just want to reiterate you're all gathered together to play a game and have fun make sure you try to keep the experience fun yes it can be frustrating learning a game for the first time and yes you're probably going to mess things up and you're going to reference the rule book multiple times and that doesn't mean you failed that's what the rule books are for board game rule books are reference material Remember, when actually sitting down to play, it's a learning game and trying to learn to play together. It shouldn't be about who wins and loses, and no one loses anything if you do choose to restart the game once you've all figured it out. This is a learning experience. Relax, have some fun, experiment in the game, do things that seem like the absolute worst terrible strategy just to see what happens. This is your chance to play around. Your next play can be all about figuring out who the champion is and the optimum strategy and maximizing everything. For now, sit back and have fun. Well, that's it for our tips and tricks for opening up a game and getting it to the table played right away. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. All right, lobbyists, what about you guys? Do you have any thoughts on getting that game right to the table straight without ever opening it before. So I remember there was one on our Discord, which I'm uh, pretty sure the person who said it is live in the chat and they could repeat, but I am opening that up and now my internet's good enough. We're not going to crash while I do this. Well, I know there were definitely some strong opinions. Some of those strong opinions I was men mentioning earlier yes. came from our chat room. People like and want to be the ones punching their own games. Games, yes. So uh, I don't know if she's in the chat tonight, but Danielle had mentioned who doesn't love punching games. And I'd say there are people who do not. Deanna hates punching games. She's just so worried she's going to rip or tear or punch something wrong or lose a piece. She hates to do it. Uh, I'm going back. Here's the chat. I, Hold I have to say, I have no, I couldn't care less who punches a game. I'm one of the ones who wants to read the rule book. 
Uh, yeah. I really, but, and, and it's weird because I find the physical rule book in front of me with the components in front of me, I can learn mm -hmm. a game, no problem. Uh, the videos, while I've been enjoying them, I enjoy them for playing on Board Game Arena, where right. I don't have components, where I don't have the physical rule book in front of me. Uh, it's definitely not my preferred way. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember when, the last time I was down at your place, you were you were doing some work on Am uh, on Amazon, sharing deals and stuff, and, and I picked up Aventuria. the Aventuria book and learned how to play Aventuria. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, again, it's not not really that hard a game. Uh, I wish I'd read Space Base instead, but ah, uh, yeah, uh, no, it was uh, you know I, I I like reading rule books. Yeah, so do I. To me, that's the lonely fun. Should do a whole episode on lonely fun at some point. Like I I love organizing my games. I love spending hours sitting there and putting the right tokens. And it's, the problem is I tend to do it before I play, and then I play and go, well, that was dumb. Why did I put these here? But doing the whole, I want, I, I love individual baggy for each player. That is my favorite. If I can get a game to that point where here's everything you need, here's everything you need, here's everything you need, here's everything you need, here's a bag for what we need to set up, and here's the bag for what we need in the second phase, right? That is my perfect setup. Yeah. So um, Courtney writes, I host, convince them they will love it, then open the box as soon as we sit down. We put on a how to play while we punch and just work through it. So yeah, that's it's kind of combining a couple of things we said, but but you're gonna do that, right? You like you don't have to stop everyone stop and watch the video, do the stuff at the same time. Uh, Pax in the chat room is saying, uh, get the teenagers to do it, and uh, their teenagers fight over who gets to punch the game. Nice. Uh, so you know, farming out the work sometimes is really easy to do, depending on your yep. uh, your family makeup. Uh, the amusing one with that, that reminds me of Tom Vasso. Tom Vasso has a lot of kids, so I'm, I don't know which of his daughters does it. He hates unboxing videos. He thinks they're dumb. He actually, his series of unboxing videos are called Yet Another Boring Unboxing Video. And what he did is one of his kids loves it. So he farms it out. One of his daughters films all of his unboxing videos because Tom couldn't be bothered. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't want to punch my games. I don't want to sort my games. I just want to sit down and play. So he does that. So bike guy, Dave said, I don't want anyone punching my game. Things rip, tear, break and get thrown away. I want to see myself. I also want to see all of the pieces as I go, which is, I did mention that. Cause that's something for me. Like if it went um. There is definitely something when you're going through a game the first time, touching everything, feeling everything. And then when you read the rules, you're like, oh, that's that counter. Oh, that's those cubes I touched earlier. Yep, absolutely. There's definitely something to be said about the tactile experience of when you read the rule book, already knowing what that piece they're referring yes. to looks like, feels like, or whatever. Oh. And and lesson for Mo that I failed on my last unboxing videos is do that before you do an unboxing video. So you're not sitting there with tapestry going, oh, it looks like three little pigs. There's like straw huts and, and brick buildings. And honestly, it really does if you haven't played the game. Okay. So so what I now do is I uh, I watch a how to play video before I unbox things when I remember to do so. I was just too excited. I really wanted to get um, some of that stuff to the table. Uh, while we are in the chat room, I do want to thank Board Games and Bourbon and Travic for the follow. Uh, and Ryan is mentioning, of course, this for this blind meeple, it's all about the tactile experience, yep, which is very, very fair. important. Very fair. And audio versions of rule books, I'm sure. Text readers. So Pax is asking, how do you feel about full sample games? In Wingspan, there's an awesome oh. game that teaches the core mechanics with specific cards and prescribed actions. Wait, those are fantastic for this exact thing. I didn't even think of that because it's not out there that often. Very that nice. that is that is great for this particular situation. Set it up, give everyone the sample cards. The the trick is to do it. Make sure the players physically do that. Don't just read it. So then he hands them this and he hands them this and then she takes this and then they do this. No, no, do it. Like like if it says Susie hands a thing to Joe, have Sean hand a thing to Deanna, right? Like yeah. physically do it because I, I we have entire episodes on teaching games, so I don't want to get into all that here. But some people learn, most people, almost everyone learn best by doing. Some people learn by hearing, some people learn by watching, but almost everyone learns best by doing. That That's a, just a proven fact. And getting people to do the stuff. Just reading out the example play isn't probably isn't helping anyone much. Do it. Act yeah. it out. Put it out. Pretend you're actors. Play through it. Another example of this is Aventuria, where you've got the uh, the sample deck, the, the, yes. the polar, uh, Master Taylor's Poltergeist. The demo kit. 
the demo kit where they just take away a lot of the decisions from the players. There's an entire yes. set of decisions that aren't in the game anymore so that you yeah. can focus on the ones that are there. And then when you play when you play later, you've got that one aspect down so you add in the second aspect. It's such a fantastic mm -hmm. way to teach a game. Again, going back to the video game idea, it's that introducing little mechanics or whatever little bit at a time yep. uh, throughout place. And I, I, there's probably good reasons for it, but I also wonder, that's the first time I've gotten as a consumer a demo kit, and it was amazing. Why aren't there more of those out there? Even more so, why aren't you sending those to local game stores? Like, I know you probably want your official demo team to do it because you know they'll do it right, but trust people. Like, people learn to play your games. They'll learn to use your demo kit appropriately. Like, I, if I owned a local game store, I would be contacting all these places. Going, do you have a demo kit for that? Like, anytime, like, hey, we're about to put this out. Do you have a demo kit for that? Because, oh, like, what a better, like, that Master Taylor's Poltergeist was just brilliant the way it slowly taught the rules. And like you said, remove choices, right? Endurance is complicated. Don't worry about it. You get to endurance turn. Don't even worry about that. Just endurance will be there. All right. You got all these different cards to choose from. You know what? Here, your entire deck's in your hand. Here's all five cards. That's your deck. You don't have to worry about what you're going to draw. You don't have to worry about getting the wrong thing. I love it. Um, more games should do it. A uh, game we're going to be reviewing later tonight actually has that. Um, it has a section that kind of walks you through a sample round in order to teach the game. Um, Race for the Galaxy technically has a really good tool for teaching the game, but I never seen anyone use it. But the back of the player mats actually have like this walkthrough that you're supposed to walk through people through. And the um, starting world cards are numbered. So you're actually supposed to hand them out to people when you first teach the game. And there are a set of numbered cards where you can play through some sample rounds. Again, almost no one does it. And I get it because it's extra this work is, and it's extra money well it's that but i also get not using them deanna hates being told how to play a game even if it's coming from the game design she would much rather sit there and learn to play the game know the rules know the mechanics and interact with them herself and make her own mistakes than be told you're going to do this on your first turn Next time around, you're going to do this. Next time around, you're going to do this and play through a full round. And then now it's you. Go. She hates that. Yeah, Dungeon Lords is another example. The, the Dungeon Lords example is really complicated. What I love about the Dungeon Lords example is halfway through, um, Vlada Shavado says, okay, now that you've done these, ask the players if they're still having fun. And if not, explain to them Dungeon Lords is not a game for them. Because that is a game that you expect to be light and fluffy, and it's one of the heaviest heroes I own. It's a really good game, but ooh, it's a, it's a brain burner, and it's not what you expect from the theme. So yes, I, like have it in there though. Like like have it for the people who do want it. Not everyone's Deanna. Not everyone is like, don't tell me what to do. I want to do it. But I think Deanna did enjoy the Aventuria onboarding, right? Because it wasn't a... Well, that was different. That, that well, didn't tell you it, what it, to yeah, do. It limited your options. Exactly. It's that limiting options, I think, is the better... Yes. Uh, the better of the choices if you're given the opportunity. Yeah. Um, there is something to be said about both... Uh, both methods mm -hmm. uh i i tend to side with deanna here i would prefer just a reduced complexity version of the game mm -hmm. to get going uh and then uh you know ramp up the difficulty once you figure out you're not playing it extreme every time like i think deanna would have hated adventure if it told her which cards to play yeah it's so on your first round tap to, sorry don't tap whatever you do i forget <laughs> now use two of your endurance to play this card then roll to attack pretend you rolled the 16 she would have hated that uh, all right. I think that's about all for our uh, lobbyists this week. Sounds good. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop.